Welcome to Real Talk, brought to you by SouthernAlberta.com, being streamed around the internet on Ustream. I'm your moderator tonight, Marty Basita. Tonight, the panel will discuss the chaining journalism landscape and how we get our news, the role of citizen journalism, how traditional and new forms of news gathering can coexist, and what the future may hold. So we're going to start off with the uh, panel introducing themselves, starting with Tina. I'm Tina Giesbrecht. I'm the Associate News Director at CJOC Radio. Um, basically, that means I'm a reporter in the morning and I anchor the news in the afternoon. My name is Dory Modney. I'm the News Director at Country 95 Radio in Lethbridge. And I have almost 30 years in journalism and broadcasting. I'm uh, Garrett Simmons with the Lethbridge Herald. I'm the uh, city editor, which means I'm basically the assignment editor for the uh, city desk of the newsroom. I'm Jen Schmidt Rempel, publisher and managing editor of Lethbridge Magazine. So I help create and put together the stories that you see in Lethbridge Living every two months. My name's Kim Seaver. I'm a bit of a black sheep, I think, here, because I don't work for a traditional news outlet. I'm the editor in chief for Lethbridge News, um, which is a volunteer news organization, so it's not my day job, unlike everybody else around the table. Um, my day job is as a professional copywriter, and which I've been doing for uh, over 25 years. I'm Terry Vogt. I'm the news director and one of the senior reporters at CTV Lethbridge. Um, I've been involved with broadcasting since uh, way 100 years ago, <laughs> since uh, 1972 or so. But um, uh, it's my job as news director. I'm also, I think with most of the small market stations, uh, we're also heavily involved in gathering and also reporting on the news too. So. Well, let's start off tonight's discussion with uh, just maybe what journalism means to you and, and doing a good job on a daily basis. I wrote down a few words, pretty simple. <laughs> Gathering, analyzing, and explaining information for an audience is pretty much journalism. Uh, citizen journalism, to me, should be the same, except it's just people who aren't professionally trained. And that's obviously a broad interpretation of citizen journalism. But I guess for me, journalism is the collection and presentation of facts describing events uh, without an attempt to, uh, to interpret. Citizen journalism, I'm very uneasy about. Yes, other people can go out and get facts, but I'm concerned about the fact that the untrained individual is uh, leading themselves and possibly other people astray, possibly creating libelous situations for themselves. And I'm concerned about the, because they don't have enough of uh, an education as to what they're doing, they may not be doing justice to a story or to the people involved in those stories. Yeah, that's a good point too, but I, th I think for me it's just all about getting as much facts, as many facts out there as possible and getting the complete story out there and, and letting people decide on their own, you know, what, what, what to make of the news basically. So it's just our job to present the facts, both sides of the story be fair and balanced and let the uh, public decide from there basically. Lethbridge Living um, takes a little bit different approach to journalism in, in the way that we can tell different kinds of stories. So where you guys pr present the immediate story, we can take those stories and maybe look at them six, eight months and follow up mm -hmm. and tell a different follow-up story or more of a story in advance. And we have the luxury of having a little bit more time to work with the people that we're telling the stories about and bring a different perspective or different point of view to those stories. And just going back to your original question, Marty, and I think I agree with a lot of what has been said and that journalism needs to be about uh, gathering and um, disseminating information in a way that isn't biased and that is objective so that um, those people who consume that information are able to do it in a way that allows them to make uh, decisions and form opinions based on the information they have and the way they interpret that without us having to influence how they interpret that information. Yeah, and I sort of agree with uh, what's been said around the table already. I think that the traditional journalist um, tries to be um, uh, tries to be objective and to get the facts out and to be as accurate as possible. But I also see um, I don't think the idea of citizen journalism is new. I think that um, forever, even mainstream journalism has tried to incorporate citizens in the process. We used to do it in the old days with radio, uh, offering cash awards for people who would call in news tips and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened now is that the average citizen journalist or the average citizen has access to technology and to getting their point of view across. And um, our challenge with the traditional journalism is keeping up to 
you know, thousands of people out there who are everywhere at once. And so it's, um, I think when you said, you know, embracing it, I think that's what a lot of the Main Street uh, journalism is trying to do today, is embrace it and use it and get involved with it as much as possible. Otherwise, you're going to be competing with it. But Terry, when you talk about somebody getting a viewpoint across, that's not, that's not specifically journalism. That's somebody giving a viewpoint. No. That's not yeah. news and that's not journalism because a viewpoint doesn't necessarily incorporate fact. No, but in order to get, for us, in order to get all the facts, you're trying to go to as many sources sure. as you can. And, and a lot of people, there are different sides to each story. Sure. Mm -hmm. But um, before, or in the old days, you used to have, you know, if you're going, say, after a crime story, you had the police on one side, and that was the only version of events you're getting. Now you're getting all kinds of information from all different sources. Not and I think accurate or not, and everyone has right. a platform. And that's what you yeah. have to watch out for. Yeah. yeah, and it's weeding through that now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, like what he said, without citizens, there's there's no journalism. I mean, every one of us relies on people calling in or phoning in or emailing us with story ideas. But it's just now that people have more avenues than ever to get their get their news out. I mean, they can su subscribe to an RSS feed from the, the police from the city. They don't need to rely on a traditional journalist relies on people, you know, on receiving emails, press releases. Anyone can do that nowadays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyone can be a citizen journalist in that regard, and it's it has changed the landscape quite a bit. But is but is a news re a news release is not it's not a story. It's no, not oh, no. journalism. It's the beginning of a story. Yeah. A news release is just a news release, and a lot of the news releases that are sent out are sent from a very very simple perspective. Whether oh, yeah, it be, certain, whether it be city hall or, or whatever organization. When that news release is issued, it's coming from a perspective from somebody else. Oh, it's sure, our yeah. responsibility to go out and get the rest of the facts behind that story. Right. A news release is just the beginning of a story. And all I'm saying is, is more people than ever have access to these news releases. They're not they're yes. not relying on <laughs> traditional news media to get these. Right. I mean, they can get them at any hour of any time of the day. So it's, Absolutely. It's a lot of people publish their news releases on uh, Newswire or yeah. Yeah. various other sources mm -hmm. as well. Any government agency or police or right. anything publishes them now, RSS feeds, like, yeah. Yeah. you can get them oh, yeah. anywhere. Um, but it's also a journalistic point of view to go into that story, find out, you know, maybe the reason behind the release mm -hmm. and get some details that isn't just in the release, just for anyone. A perfect example of that is if we get a news release from the government, whether it be the provincial government or the federal government, do we take that news release at face value? Oh, certainly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for yeah. example, a few months ago, uh, it was a it was a big issue about Jim Hillier's campaign ex well, not his campaign expenses, but his office expenses, and that information wouldn't have been released in the news release, right? So that would have been a good example of um, a chance for journalists to delve into the information and be able to disseminate the information that wouldn't readily be available. I mean, I guess you could argue that sure they published their um, hundred plus page document onto the website and making it publicly available, but who has time to scroll through that and try to find the information that they that's important to them? Mm -hmm. Well, and that those documents provide information they want to give you. It doesn't yeah, necessarily sure. provide you information that the public really wants, mm -hmm. and we see that frequently with all levels of government. And that the average person can't access just by phoning up a government official. Right, it no. takes an yeah. accredited media to sometimes get to that information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to know how to get it too. Exactly. That's the yeah. too. Is, exactly. Yeah. That's the first step in, in getting it. Yeah. I think you got brought up an interesting point before Terry when you mentioned about the the competition and that there's they're they're competing with the information getting out there. And I think that we've seen um, we're seeing a, a pressure with uh, news outlets today where they have to try and they they have there's this. There's this um, idea that we have to put out information as quickly as possible, and then of course, and for the most part, I think that, that works fine, and that we're able to get accurate information. But every once in a while, something will happen, like today, for example, and um, and incorrect information is presented. And so there's that pressure, and you have to try and balance it. being able to get out the information as quickly as people expect it to be, yeah, and still being able to verify all the information. And there's a large danger in that of getting the information out there first. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily, it's, and a lot of people Happy. just are so worried about getting it out quick that they're not Being worried accurate. about yeah, checking the facts and making sure that their story is actually yeah. accurate. So yeah. it's, it's a huge danger and it's a huge thing that I think all of us probably struggle with. I mean, we all want to get the, get the news out as quickly as possible and be, be first and look like the leader in the, community, in the community, but it can't be at the expense of doing a 
proper job and doing a, a thorough job. But why do we have to get it out that fast? I would argue that we don't. I, I prefer to see news brought out accurate as opposed to fast. Is it, you know, a, case, you can, is it a case story where management is saying yes. this? Yes. Well, I think. In the changing landscape, how do you deal yeah. with this now as journalists and so, going forward? from what we've seen today from the Boston sure. Marathon bombings. How, how do you face that challenge on a daily basis? Well, let's, let's face it. it. Um, the larger the community, the bigger the news organization, the higher the stakes. It's much easier for us, possibly, in, in this sort of environment this, where we can say, where well, I say to myself, I don't care how fast you get it out. I want you to make sure that it's accurate. I mean, just because some there's a, a fender bender down that, not every, everybody does not need to have information like right now. How is having that information about a traffic accident impacting your personal life? It isn't. Um, getting that information out, a lot of it, it doesn't have to be gotten, gotten out that quickly. It just doesn't. Well, it's going to tell you right away that you're not going to take that route home. Yeah. So, well, and it's so, the way we've started so, to consume news but, yeah. and media, though. That's the way we've started to consume that information now, is when something goes on, we're going to Twitter, we're going to Facebook, we mm -hmm. want to know right away what's going on. And that's what the public has started to come to expect, is that they're going to get that news first on Twitter, whether, and it may not be accurate, but that's what the expectation of consumption is now. That, that's that's, a, and, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And I think that um, people will switch now. A lot quicker than they used to. They won't wait for five o'clock. They won't mm -hmm. wait for mm -hmm. six o'clock. They're going to go where they can get it immediately. And if it's not on one, they'll switch away from you and they'll go to somebody who has it. Yeah. So that's why that. And and I don't agree that it's management necessarily that's putting the pressure on it, but um, there is pressure because you know that you want to be competitive. You want to be mm -hmm. one of. You want to be among the leaders. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be the one who's who's always well there. Don't even worry about them because they're not covering it, right? So, so there is pressure. I I would say too, and I and Dory, I unfortunately um, being in a smaller community doesn't mean that you're immune to the pressure because no. uh, if something big happens here, it just means that you have fewer people to compete against everybody else sure. who's looking for that information, whether it's now people coming from Calgary or Edmonton or Toronto or Montreal or Ottawa or New York, if it's a big event, they're sure. going to be coming here looking for that information and putting resources into it that we can't possibly compete right. with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And certainly every, every news department in the city feels that pressure. But do we do it? Uh, do we sometimes do it to ourselves? I was going to say, to be oh. fair, there's <laughs> always been competition between news yeah. outlets yeah. as yeah. to who can get what story sure. on first. Yeah. It used to just be, you know, the 12 o'clock news or the 5 o'clock news, and now people have the landscape has changed so much. People have so much access to information every second of the day that mm -hmm. we are right in the race with everyone else. Just oh, yeah. to try and tweet it first. You know, it's. That's, it's the yeah, same you see competition. The, the media Twitter battles where you know one guy will get it ten seconds earlier than the next guy, yeah. and the next guy will get it up there right, <laughs> but if you're first right away. Line, and it's you kinda, feel that sense of well, I got up there yeah. first, you know. I, I yeah. guess, but it, but I, I think what you're saying is, is that a really big deal? I mean, is, well, is it a big deal that I got it out thirty seconds earlier than you did, or right. no. you got it out forty seconds earlier than I did? But today, no, but. today is a good example with what happened in in Boston. I mean, there was such that there's that we got to get it out first. We got to get it out first. Well, what happened? You, you've got all this all this misinformation. At some point, that misinformation is going to catch up with a media outlet. And what does it do to your credibility? I mean, there's some media outlets down in the States that have literally become laughing stocks because of what they're doing. Newtown was a good, another good example of it. When it's they perfect. started post, uh, publishing Adam Lanza's brother's Facebook profile page right. and saying that that was Adam Lanza. And that's another good example. Just because there's that pressure to be the first person. But, I mean, to be fair, when I heard about the Boston bombings, first thing I did was go to Google and type in Boston bombing. And whoever came up first, that's the one I went to. I mean, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think I'm an atypical news consumer either. I think probably a lot of people do that, have that same sort of habit that they go through when they want to. Yeah, I, I, would, I would think we're all on Twitter. We're all following news on Twitter. Hopefully you're following us tonight on Twitter. If you have a question, <laughs> put Real Talk SAB in a hashtag and we'll maybe get it on the uh, air to ask the panel. But again, just dealing with those pressures and specifically about citizen journalism. And we know they don't maybe hold the same standards that accredited journalists mm -hmm. have. Is society going to laugh, have some backlash at some point over this, do you think? Or 
Is this just the way we have to do business now as journalists? I don't, I don't, I think there'll be some backlash. I mean, I guess it just depends on the product that you put out. I mean, if your product is reliable and dependable, then people are going to be able to respect that. But if you keep putting out, there was, uh, at the same time that Lethbridge News um, emerged on the scene, there was another um, organization that also called themselves Lethbridge News. Um, and they had a lot of practices that were, um, that were very unprofessional. You, posting people's profile pic Facebook pictures, linking to their Facebook profiles, things like that. And eventually, it, it didn't take long for people to take note of them and realize, you know, that this, these, per these people, whoever was involved in it, they weren't taking it seriously. They, were, they weren't concerned with trying to get out accurate information that people can consume and um, do it reliably. And so I think there will be a backlash to, uh, regarding the people who don't take it seriously or who mess up repeatedly. I guess, how do you know if it's accurate, though, in citizen journalism? I mean, how do you trust that what that person is reporting well, is right? I, I can't speak for all citizen journalism organizations, but for Left Vision News, I don't, for the most part, I don't think we cover news articles that other news outlets in Lethbridge don't cover. And so in that regard, I mean, you can compare what we're saying with what the other outlets are saying as well. Okay, yeah. but what do you yeah. cover? What, what do we cover? What do you cover? Uh, news and events, just like everybody else. But what do you report on? News and events. How? The information that people submit to us. I mean, obviously, like I said at the beginning, we're a volunteer organization. We don't have paid staff who can afford to take, to devote time during the day to be able to go out to an event or uh, a, uh, an, an occasion and be able to uh, interview people and report live on the scene, that sort of thing. So we're restricted in that way, and that's fine. I mean, that's, that's, that's our business model, and it works fine for us. And I don't think Lethbridge News is going to be replacing any other, other news outlets because they have a different business model that works for them as well and for their readership or uh, their audience and that sort of thing. So, um, so we depend heavily and perhaps more heavily on people submitting information to us, whether it's um, photos or uh, information, breaking news, or even just regular news releases as well. But are you not concerned about the liability of doing that because you, you don't know all the time what's being submitted to you and whether or not it's factual? Um, no, we're not concerned about liability because we don't report everything that's emailed to us. Because, I mean, there are lo there's a lot of things that are emailed to us that are very questionable and we'll, we'll reply back to them and say, can you give us some more information or provide us a source where we can you know, follow up with this or that sort of thing. I mean, of oftentimes we'll receive uh, emails from individuals whose name appeared in a, in a crime story and they're concerned that their name's getting plastered all over the internet or whatever and they say, oh, all the charges were dropped and so we'll confirm with Alberta courts, is, is it true that the charges were dropped? And they'll either confirm it or they say no, it wasn't. And sometimes people are just lying and they just want their name to be taken off the internet or whatever else. So, um, but yeah, we don't, we don't publish every single thing that we receive. And how do you handle comments then? In terms uh, of liability? We have a commenting policy. And so there are specific things that we don't allow. We don't allow anything that's uh, raced, racist. We don't allow anything that's um, uh, that directs violence towards anybody, don't allow profanity. I mean, we have five or six things in our commenting policy that we've outlined for the last two years. I think that's a challenge for all <laughs> news organizations too, because you look at our, you know, it depends on the story. Like if we run a, like say a fluoride story or something like that, I mean, the comments that we can get on our website are, I mean, they, they can come fast and furious and you hardly have time to keep up yeah. managing mm -hmm. the comments. So that's a, that's a, I think it's a huge concern for all of us at this stage too. Well, I think, yeah, especially as we get more into uh, Facebook sites and websites mm -hmm. and, um, and Twitter is a good example too, because that's immediate and, um, and you're yeah, getting reactions immediately. And so you have to be, and, and somebody has to be monitoring. If mm -hmm. they're not monitoring it, then you can run into some serious trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there are very many organizations in the smaller areas anyway that have people that are dedicated specifically to um, social media. So mm -hmm. it's, it's usually a, a s part of everybody's job, mm -hmm. and you're hoping that somebody mm -hmm. has time to 
sort of get in there and look at it. And have you embraced, you and your organization, you personally, have you embraced integrating citizen journalism into your format? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> obviously. I, th but I think uh, for, for the traditional. I think you know. we always have to a certain extent. If there's a crash on the highway, someone will send us a picture. That is technically a form of citizen journalism. We give them credit for their photo. We say, you know, go for go to our website for a picture, and, and there it is. That's a minor form of it, but it still is. Mm -hmm. um, we get phone calls. We get uh, oh, there's smoke on the west side. Is another fire. Well, okay, take it for what it is. We follow up on it for sure. But that's still a form of. Mm -hmm. information coming into us, us obviously verifying it, mm -hmm. and then disseminating the information that's factual. So, so I think any mm -hmm. of the story pitches we receive are citizen journalism because that's somebody coming to you saying, hey, I have this fantastic story or I know something's going on with this other person, look at them and look at doing a story on them. So certainly we have to get our stories from the people around us. And it goes both ways too. Exactly. We make a mistake or if there's something that's not correct or yeah something that someone feels should be added to the story. Absolutely. Again, we'll check the facts, we'll call around, we'll we'll do our due diligence and we'll add it to the story. You know, yeah. that's it goes both ways. Yeah. 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 Oh and that's growing. I mean we have like I say we have a hometown page, a community page where it's it's all submissions. That's all we that's all we take on those pages. And we have a community news team where we have some people that we've that we've recruited from the community to help cover help us cover events and that's been very successful as well. So yeah, I think every news organization, especially as you know, our newspaper industry obviously is facing, you know, challenges. I mean, we have to look at other avenues to generate news as well. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a constantly evolving process for us and probably for everybody. I think when we had the grass fires, that was, uh, that was uh, mm -hmm. an eye-opener for us uh, in terms of how people were. Because, because uh, uh, most radio, TV <coughs> newscasts are scheduled for certain times, but these events are happening between the times when they're scheduled and people wanted information between times and so I, I think we felt that we either had to get on board and, and really embrace this thing or else we were going to be left behind so. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, the grass fire say um, the late November one well it wasn't one it was actually three we had the low cost <laughs> fire the grass fire out there the grass fire out there and unfortunately uh, a lot has been learned since then but that wasn't social media's finest hour. Um, we were in our newsroom from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 2 o'clock in the morning and over half of what we dealt with was negating false information and when we asked these people, well, where are you getting this from? What you, where are you hearing this? And I mean it got to the point where we had a young, young family, this guy put his wife and his young kids in their motor home and left West Lethbridge because they were told, they thought it was being evacuated and we asked, where are you getting this from? Twitter, 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 Twitter. Well, where and then some of these people, well, we heard this on Twitter, we heard that on Twitter. It was not a good scene. If anything positive came out of that, um, the city of Lethbridge, the emergency departments, and even Alberta Emergency Alert discovered very quickly that they had to do something to change what they were doing. But in that situation, citizen journalism was not a good thing. It created chaos for the fire department, for the police officers, and a nightmare for our but as But as journalists, though, um, we can't, I don't think we can worry about what other people are reporting. What we have to do is report the facts. And right. so we can, we can see what other people are reporting and that's where our role can be to make sure that they have the correct information. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I mean, I agree with you, it's, it doesn't always, no. Twitter doesn't mean it's true no. or the internet doesn't mean it's true, but, uh, but there's still a role that we can play in terms of how we can make sure the public has the right information. And be the sources that the public turns to right. when the grass mm -hmm. fires start, when mm -hmm. something like that goes on to. You might see a tweet come up, but then you look for those tweets out there from CJOC, from CTV, from the Lethbridge Herald, just to say, oh, okay, these, this is what these guys are reporting, then this must be true. Somebody has verified it, and they're the ones that know what they're talking about. Right. And but, even though yeah. we had wall-to-wall -wall coverage that Sunday, mm -hmm. I got called yeah. into work, we had wall-to-wall -wall coverage our website still got 21,000 hits in 24 hours. Yeah. People were still going mm -hmm. to websites to get information, yeah. even though we were on the air for yeah. four, five, six hours, seven hours yeah. straight. Right. So it is, I mean, it's a tool you have to use it. People are turning to it, so yeah. you've got to embrace it. And I have to agree with what Dory was saying because it seemed like every second tweet we were sending out was telling people no. People were asking us, is there an evacuation order in effect on the west side? 
And no, it's like every other tweet, no, there's no evacuation, or no, there's not, no, there's not. Right. And kept sending them to the city of Lethbridge's website. Cause, yeah. And they were better, I think, this time than they were back in September of 2011. November, November, that was the November one. The, oh, okay, the, and then the, the other one was one. September. Okay, that yeah. was referring to the September one, which was, I think, the city of Lethbridge did a better job social media than they did in the November of 2011 one, and which helped helped us because we were able to provide reliable information rather than having to depend solely on um, what people were telling us uh, on on social media. Um, to that point, though, um, in the the first one, the November 2011 fire, um, what was interesting is that um, people were reporting that they had been evacuated by police officers, mm -hmm. and despite that, the next day, the chief of police was saying they didn't evacuate anybody, even though there were several people. We had two dozen people tell us that the police came to their door, knocked on the door, and told them they had to leave. And so, and, but then social media um, was blamed for all the inaccurate information, but it seemed like there was just a communication breakdown, just generally speaking, not but just there are, social media. there are times when the police don't know what other police exactly. are doing. <laughs> right. You have RCMP <laughs> going door to door evacuating people, or RCMP sure. blocking a highway, and the city police say, no, we're not blocking any roads. Yeah. But RCMP are, yeah. because they're working in the county. So, I mean, um, yeah, it's, a, it's like there's lots of different versions of what happened. But you look at the coverage between those two fires, and it's, it's just... It, it's it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable how far the whole yeah. process has yeah. come. I mean, yeah. the, even the way, like I said, the way the city did it, the way the province dealt with it. Yeah. They did a, I, th I thought they did an amazing job compared to the first one. And I mean, yeah, there was, there was information at your fingertips, you know, right yeah. away. And sometimes it's, you know, again, it's not always going to be accurate, but there was no shortage of information from uh, every news outlet. It was, it was pretty amazing to see. there was less people retweeting random people, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you looked on the first one, half the people said CCH was burning down on the west side when yeah. it was just mm -hmm. smoky, you know? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And now, I think after that experience, the second one, people started saying, okay, now I'm going to go and just look at news tweets, or just look at city tweets, or just look yeah. at the Alberta emergency yeah. tweets. They yeah. were very picky about what they followed and what they retweeted, which cleared yeah. things up a lot. Well, and this time around, we didn't even do a, a, a story on our website. We just kept forwarding everybody to the city's website. You know, that, that's where the information is. And to us, it's we're more concerned about um, uh, funneling information to people rather than trying to, you know, edit the information and present it to people. So it's just more important. Here's, Here's the information at the source, and this is where you go to get it. So, yeah. and I think in the, at the end of the day, you have to give people some credit, and hopefully they they're not going to take you know Joe Blow's Twitter account off the street as 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 gospel. And you hope that they're going to go to the TV stations, to the radio stations, mm -hmm. to the to the newspaper, and get the, that reliable information. You have to hope that's what they're doing, and they're taking all this information and making their own informed decision on. Mm -hmm. So that's at the end of the day, what you hope is going to happen. But yeah. obviously, you can't stop people from jumping to conclusions and. Mm -hmm taking things on different tangents and you're, you're never going to stop that but no and I don't think people are doing it maliciously yeah I think they're doing it to try to help they might not know the whole situation but I don't think anybody's doing it maliciously mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing if no. anyone's interested and wants to share information it's exactly. never a bad thing ever exactly uh, someone from Twitter is asking can traditional journalism coexist with citizen journalism in the same market or will there always be some form of animosity that's Jen tweeting that if you're talking citizen journalism organizations as I'm opposed to citizen to. journalism, because we've always <laughs> embraced citizen journalism, we talked about that already. Um, if you're talking about a set organization, I think, yeah, why not? I'm just concerned as long as there's accurate information and people are getting that information, then that's the key thing. Obviously, I share Dory's concerns with that's the big thing is libelous issues yes. and things like that. Um, comments using minors' names that have been charged and things like that. I mean, obviously that's stuff that we cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not your not, organization. But if it's not an organization, maybe someone else can do it. I don't know what the well, rules are. We had that happen to us last week yeah. on an article that we were posting. There was a 16 or 17 year old boy who was um, charged with kicking someone in the head. And the police didn't release the person's name because he's a minor. But then someone comments on our article and posts a link to the person's Facebook page. So of course we just deleted the comment. But I mean, and it wasn't us providing the information, but there could be those that that the optics, right? That we're responsible for that page and we're allowing that information again. So maybe people would see it as us presenting that information. So we say, well, then we're not even going to bother with it. We'll just delete the comment. Well, well. but you can't stop anybody from doing that on any page sure. you, or any you, Twitter you accounts or any of our accounts. We can't stop anybody from posting that stuff. But there's you, a difference. You can go on and delete it, 
but we can't stop the actions of other people from sure. going no. onto mm -hmm. our accounts and posting but, comments. But the, like that. that's the responsibility has to lie with them. Yes. Right. If if I if we control what's information is posted on our websites, yeah. then we've taken our we we fulfill our responsibility. Yeah. And if well, you take those posts down, yeah. then yes, you're fulfilling your responsibility. And but if they want to post on their Twitter them. account or on their own personal blog or whatever, well, they're going to have to take the responsibility for that. That's nothing we can do yeah. about it. As short as a couple of days ago, though, there was still the name of the young man on, on the comments section on your website. He's actually still on there today. Is it still on there today? It's still on there today. Really? Really? Yeah. Person, yeah. And, and yeah, you can get in trouble for that. Oh, I We can be sued it, so. for it. But the, the, name, the name of this young person um, is still on there. Huh. Okay, well, I'll look again because I, I personally deleted the comment. It looked like it had been, there's it's a little word edited, edited yeah. but the name of the young person is still there. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that I take care of that. Well, this brings up a question from Mike McKinnon. I'm sure this question's on the list, but he wants to hear from everyone. How do you deal with your organization getting facts wrong in today's day and age? We correct it right away. I mean, the next day, uh, if, it's, if it's a story on the website, we go in there and correct it right, at it right away. And yeah, you have to, I mean, even trained journalists with four-year four -year degrees are gonna, and 10 years of experience are going to make mistakes. It's just, it's just going to happen, but you have to own up to it and uh, admit it right away and fix it as soon as possible. That's, mm -hmm. That has to, be the way, has to be the way it's done. And there's so many avenues for people to call you out on your mistakes nowadays, <laughs> yeah. like Facebook, our website, Twitter. Um, they'll call the newsroom and tell us if we're wrong, and you, know, you apologize and you fix it. It's, mm -hmm. We've run into mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. We've run into a situation of late, I've noticed too, where people will comment on Twitter and Facebook they think we've made a mistake. We haven't made a mistake. And then you politely say, well, no, that's accurate. Uh, a, a good one was a couple of days ago was the way we wrote the word marijuana. <laughs> and it was written with an H. That's a Spanish form. And of course, somebody posted, you know, you got this wrong. It's with a J. And uh, as I'm explaining to the person, someone else had tweeted. And then, of course, the people who made the original comment, they start pulling off their comments. And what people don't realize, too, is that when they comment on our Twitter or Facebook sites, they also open themselves up to comment and rebuttal from other people. And I don't think they realize that, and it becomes quite a shock to them when other people start disagreeing with them. So we've had quite a few people pull their own posts off of our Facebook, and then people will ask, well, why did you pull that post off? Well, we didn't do that. Somebody else did. We only pull posts off if there's libel, slander, if they're inciting hatred, or if there's extreme profanity. I mean, we can deal with a hell or a damn, but anything beyond that, it's not mm -hmm. going to fly. Mm -hmm. If you have factual information to add to our story, or if we've got something wrong, we're not going to delete the post. No. If you can do it in a way that's not obscene. If you no. can't, then yes, we delete it. And <laughs> we talked about this in our newsroom today, and we, c we do not edit comments. Um, if the comment is objectionable, it's simply removed. We don't edit. Because if you edit a comment, then you're changing what somebody said. So if it's an objectionable comment, it's better just to pull it off. Um, so we've talked a little bit about integrating citizen journalism. The Herald has already got you know, your citizen journalist page and stuff like that. How do you see your other uh, media integrating citizen journalism more as it goes forward? Because I think it's out there now and everyone is using it in some form or another, I guess, maybe what is the best way to go about using it as another tool in your field? Well, I know in, uh, with us, uh, we have a similar thing in some of the websites for CTV have mine use where people can submit videos, um, comments, that sort of thing, and then uh, it can be posted right on our websites. Um, we don't have mine news in Lethbridge because our we don't have our own website. We work out of the Calgary website, but um, we try to incorporate. I, I think we just uh, we we work with people. We contact them now through social media in a lot of cases. That's how we make our contacts. Uh, it seems like more and more these days, people don't have their own home phones anymore. <laughs> They're either they have a cell phone or they have uh, Facebook or they have Twitter or something. But you're you're usually contacting them that way and. Um, I mean, there's still a segment of the population that has telephone books, but uh, a lot of the contacts are made through social media, so. 
Anyone else? And right away you're asking for <coughs> a, a, the Boston Marathon. I mean, if there's somebody local who's in Boston, you have pictures of what happened. Can you send us some pictures? Uh, that sort of thing. So. All of our story pitches are taken from citizens, and we've actually just started um, with a lot of the press releases and stuff like that. We get we do have our news section on our website, but we've started incorporating a section we call um, the Living Buzz section, and it is news and event or news going on around Southern Alberta. Um, for instance, the young gentleman that started up the Kilt Up for Cancer uh, fundraiser out out in Lethbridge. We couldn't get out that day to cover the launch of the event. But what um, he did was he sent me some photos and we had his press release and everything like that. We did a, a photo, a little blurb on what he was doing um, and we're running that in our next issue. It's not a full story, but there are small news segments now um, that we can get and we can, we can give those groups not only web time, we can give them some print time, we can give them some time on our events calendar, those sorts of things. So we're pulling those different things in too, just to get more people involved and, and interacting with the magazine. A lot of news departments will have different, like there's hard news and then there's soft news. A lot of the soft news, sure, we, we take photographs and again, credit them. We certainly scrutinize those photographs too, particularly if you're dealing with something like um, a more hard news story like a, a um, critical injury or death or traffic accident, fatality, that sort of thing. You're going to scrutinize photographs of those vehicles to make sure there's nothing identifiable so that if you're posting something you're not posting something where the family's going to find out before the police get there to tell you. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. A really, it's a really touchy situation. Yeah. That's the thing, too. Mm. You still, even though someone has sent a picture to you or a video to you, it's still your obligation as a professional news organization to verify that what you're seeing or watching is factual as well, which can mm -hmm. sometimes be difficult. Um, I know, obviously, this isn't a Lethbridge issue, but citizen journalism in like the Arab Spring and in Syria and all that kind of stuff. That's how a lot of that information was getting to mainstream media, so the things that were actually going on. But a lot of those videos were questioned because if you are um, a supporter of a certain cause or you, know, you can still have an agenda and send it to a mainstream media and they don't know whether it's true or not mm -hmm. because they're not there, they don't have access. So yeah. oh, obviously yeah. it's a different extreme in Lethbridge, but you still have to be very critical about what you're looking at and, and make sure you have your bases covered before you claim that as news and, and broadcast it from your own organization. Yeah, because yeah. some people are absolute wizards on Photoshop oh, or exactly. video editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can do miracles. It, it can look you know, like 100% authentic and you, you would have no idea that it's a fake. Or, no, you yeah. can't just and take it as fact. Yeah. Like that hawk in Montreal picked up. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah, <that's a> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, we've all uh, worked for organizations that have maybe seen their uh, numbers of staff dwindle over the years and and you see citizen journalism as a way to help supplement your newsroom in a way to help maybe beef it up and, and cover more topics and, and be more aware of what's going on is, is this uh, uh, another plus I guess for citizen journalism going forward especially in a small market like ourselves yeah I think it has to be because I mean uh, none of us I think have a newsroom that's big enough to be everywhere at once and uh, you have to rely on community input to some degree to to get things out there, I mean, and again, you have to be very critical and very, and you have to scrutinize everything you get. But you do, you do, and you want the community to be involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone uh, shoots a photo and it, and it gets printed in the Herald. Hey, that's that's great. They're going to call their their mother, their brother, their sister there, and say, Hey, my photos in the in the trail. Go check it out. Hey, that's that's a win win for us. We get an event covered. We give someone some press that they might not have otherwise have, have received, and and you know we, it, that helps everybody. So yeah, I think it's something that I think we all have to embrace to a degree. I think um, for us, um, it's, it's, it helps in some ways. It doesn't help in terms of necessarily um, writing the stories and doing that sort of thing. But I think where we found it helpful is in, um, you know, years ago, if uh, something happened in the Crow's Nest Pass, we would have to send a crew to the pass to get some video or pictures because um, not everybody embraced cameras and <laughs> video the way they do now. I, I mean, I, I kind of look at this whole social media stage that we're in right now, similar to when I sort of entered the television scene from radio back in the, uh, in the early 80s. And TV was just coming into its own. You would, um, prior to that, getting people to appear on television was sometimes difficult because they weren't comfortable with, with cameras and that sort of thing. But 
it, over time they've become comfortable with cameras and it's not a difficult task anymore in most cases. But um, now everybody carries cameras and their phones and that sort of thing. And so there's so much more access to video. Mm -hmm. And so we, we use it in, in those terms rather than maybe sending somebody to the crow's nest pass to cover something that we can get 30 seconds of video sent to us by somebody there and then we verify the facts say through police and that sort of thing so it sort of supplements what we're doing but 20 years ago um, I, I know probably our editors would have said that video is not good enough to show on TV we won't you know the quality <laughs> isn't there so don't show that mm -hmm. now it's like people aren't so much interested in quality they want they, they want to see the pictures, they want to see the images and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and that said, that's why in, I think we have a clear divide in, in our papers to what is, con is content that we generate as professional journalists and what is a community or hometown mm -hmm. story. So we make that different, you know, we make that, uh, that divide that, you know, this is our professional journalism work on page one on, you know, the sports section and this is, the, this is community content, which I'm not, not to say it's not as important. I mean, it's, it's very important to the people that submit it and it's very important to the people that read it. But uh, I, I guess in the end, you know, our hope is that people will still trust professional journalists and they, st they will still want to flip open a paper or look at the story online or read an online edition and see a complete story on a city council topic. That may be a citizen journalist, while well, a citizen journalist can't provide that. They can't provide the depth and the, and the perspective on it that maybe that we can as a professional journalist. And that's, I guess that's our hope that people really will, will continue to, to consume that news in that way as well and just not... People want the, the quick news hits. That's that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future. But we do hope that people will still, and well, we, and people need that too. People need to know the depth of a story, and they need to know why it's happening and, and how it's going to affect them. And that's one thing that professional journalists can really provide. So, and I think that's a really good point. I mean, and going back to Jen's question from Twitter, um, I think that there's um, that uh, citizen journalist citizen journalism organizations and traditional news organizations can coexist. Because um, obviously, like for Lethbridge News, for example, we can't provide that in-depth um, coverage. Uh, well, I mean, we could, but people just wouldn't get any sleep. Um, and so there's there's still that market there. There there are people who want to have in-depth analysis. Whereas with Lethbridge News, we're just interested in getting the information out, distributing the information, and uh, not necessarily devoting time to um, providing that analysis. We just wanted to get you know here here's the information um, in its uh, unadulterated form and this, this is the way it is like well for example uh, speaking of city council uh, if we'll look at the city council agenda for the upcoming meeting and we'll go through it and think well what information here is going to be um, it, something that the public's going to find interesting that, that, that's going to uh, be important to them because generally they don't aren't really concerned with the second reading of ch um, changing something from um, R7 to R1 zoning or whatever, but we, so we got to try and go through it and we give a brief um, sentence or two about what the uh, topic is and then we provide a link to the agenda and people can read all the details for themselves, but whereas uh, Lethbridge Herald would provide, and other news organizations would provide more in-depth information, they would, they, they have the resources and the time to be able to dedicate someone to spend several hours going through that information, analyzing and presenting in a consumable format. And so I think, I think they can, they can, con that I think there's oh, an yeah. occasion yeah. for them to coincide. Yeah, it can co coexist. Co uh, another question that keeps coming up in, in certain forms is, does citizen journalism muddy the waters too much? Uh, How do you respond to something like that? Well, I mean, that's, that, that's a pretty general statement. I think it can. I think some citizen journalists or, or some citizen journalism um, organizations can muddy the water, but I think there are some citizen journalist uh, organizations that are dedicated to, to doing the best they can to provide reliable, accurate, unbiased information. And it, in those cases, I don't think they muddy the water. I think they're just another source for information for people to consume. I mean, the, the, the Pulitzer Prize for National Journalism this past week is an online news source. It isn't even a traditional news, um, uh, traditional news outlet. As a news reporter, I, I don't have a problem with, with it because I find that, to me, it's like um, 
it just it's one more place where people can get news and it's one and and often it's or maybe not often but there are times when it's something we may not choose to cover mm -hmm. or it's something that um, we can't cover that well because we're focusing on other stories so I think it's just uh, one more place where people can get information and to me that's not a bad thing I think um, for society in general the more information people can get they don't have to just listen to one radio station they don't have to just watch one TV newscast and I think more and more we see that even um, you know you see the news blocks but people will be turning from one station to the next to the next and the same thing with um, uh, you know, going online, you, you maybe check out a couple of different sources and see what the different stories are. So, I don't see it as a bad thing. But I mean, and, and not only can we can we coexist, I think we can we can certainly help each other. I mean, there's there's story ideas that we've gotten. I'm sure we've all gotten from some from a citizen journalist or from that that we've been able to to take and maybe start it as a rumor somewhere, and we've been able to make a bunch of calls and and get the complete story out there. So yeah, we can definitely help each other and. In that, in that regard and, and coexist. I mean, that's certainly, and like, like Terry said, the more voices out there, the better, the more opinions, the more, the more facts peop that people can get and make their own informed decisions on, the better. I mean, so. And it's about getting people engaged in what you're doing and what you're reporting on. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think those are all good points. I think if, it, fundamentally, if it comes down to the most important thing, getting the information out, um, then I think that's really what matters. And I think traditionally there's been this there's been this environment where um, everybody's competing against each other and there isn't the sharing of information between or news organizations. Um, and it'd be nice if somehow, if there was some sort of mechanism or some, some sort of system in place where, where we can collectively and collaboratively share information so that we all presenting, I mean, not necessarily the same story, but we'll be able to take this information and be able to present it in a way that we know our readers appreciate, but they often, uh, I envy uh, citizen journalists sometimes because I'll look and see a story and say, boy, I wish I could have spent more time on that story. Or I'll cover a story that I feel is really impactful and, and enjoyable and I really want to get the details out there and we just don't have the platform to do it. <coughs> like we're limited in the amount of time we can spend on it. So um, I think for us that's where the uh, the websites and the the Facebook sites and stuff have sort of helped us to expand our coverage a bit from beyond our minute 45 two minute news story mm -hmm. that we run at during the newscast and we can add more details for some of the social media coverage that we give it but it still doesn't replace that in-depth story that a newspaper can provide that sort of thing so um, I just got a comment for a stop Dory stop looking at your phone well the reason I'm looking at <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm looking at it well someone's asking there are things that journalists know what not to report on how does citizen journalism feel about reporting on a suicide um, well as far as Lethbridge news goes um, we we try our best when there is a suicide to not report it as a suicide. Um, well, how can you not? I, I mean, it is what it is. So how do you? How do you? Like not? for example, there was one just this past week, right. and uh, the inf all the inf um, we only reported that the Lethbridge Regional Police confirmed that there was a death, but we never we never reported it as a suicide um, because they didn't release any information. We just said that we got these. We got several reports. Can you confirm that there is a death in this park? And they said, Yeah, we can confirm. And they told us it was uh, a suicide. But I mean, it wasn't a it wasn't a uh, um, an official release, and so I didn't think it was appropriate for us to report it as such. And so we just reported it as there was a death in the park, and the police have confirmed that. So. I guess that brings up the issue too: is if the police aren't releasing something, maybe they're not releasing it for a reason. And not talking about suicide, but sure. um, say there's a tag team somewhere and mm -hmm. something's going on, and people can obviously see that it's happening. And sometimes traditional media gets criticized for not reporting that it's happening when we're respecting the wishes of the police that we not report something until it's complete, until right. what they're doing is done, and that you know we have all the information. And sometimes I think people are in such a hurry to get that information out, and then we you know, we get criticized for, well, why aren't you reporting that? Why aren't you reporting that? Well, 
sometimes it's a matter of public safety. There's a reason why we're not reporting it, and I think some people don't understand that sometimes. Well, well, you're right. People want to know right away. They want to know yeah. right, right now, away. regardless. I, I, I saw the park was taped safety, off. Right? Why was it taped off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there's a reason. Like yeah. you know, we're holding back for a reason. Usually, if people phone the newsroom, we explain what it is and they understand. But when you're putting it out there, especially on the air, it's, it sounds very harsh, and you're basically you're feeding into the pain of the family and the friends who are having to immediately deal with this. Is that justifiable? No. Now, if you've got somebody who commits suicide in such a way, like they shoot themselves in the head downtown or whatever, you pretty much have to explain or say that's what it is. But hmm. we try not to deal with those ones that happen in parks and stuff. Um, it's just it's somebody else's pain. So how do you how do you differentiate between that and say the police saying, you know, we have officers on scene in the river bottom, we're investigating a report of uh, a, a body that was found near the bridge. That's it. Yeah, but I mean, what's the difference? In the case of, uh, and this has happened quite often, I mean, if it's under the bridge, you just leave it at that. People know what it is. People are saying, why are the police down there? They found a body. That's all you sure. have to say. Right. But that's that, all you have to say. In this case, that's all we said, too. We said the police found a body in the park. That's all we said. So I, I just don't see the difference. Why is it okay to report on one, in, on one occasion, but not okay to report on the other occasion? When it's the same circumstances. We take them on a situation by situation basis. And, we'll leave you. and I think that's part of traditional media is yeah. using that news judgment and I think that's what <laughs> traditional media worries about with citizen journalism is the fact that they don't have that experience or they don't have anything to draw upon so how does how does maybe citizen journalism how do you think the best way to deal with that kind of stuff is going forward um, well I mean suicide specifically there there's resource um, put out by a suicide watch organization where they give outlines on how to report um, on suicide they have specific guidelines, and those are the guidelines that we follow. And so, I, and that, you know, I think they're, I think they're reasonable guidelines, and they allow you to treat suicide in a respectful way, um, while still being able to provide the information. Uh, but in a more general sense, I think it just comes with time. Like I, I think that Lethbridge News approaches news differently now than it did three years ago. I mean, when we started, we started with a, a ragtag group of volunteers and who were just really interested in trying to get information out. There were a couple of us with some journalism information, but our experience, but uh, most of us didn't have it. And uh, we made some mistakes along the way, and we've learned from those mistakes. And I think for the most part of the last year or two that we've been able to provide reliable, unbiased information in a way that, um, that doesn't try to skew the story that we're trying to prevent. Uh, present. Okay, you're not keeping up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> letting people talk to her. Okay. Um, sorry, I've lost it now and, here. And not everything needs to be addressed that's on Twitter. No, but there, <laughs> well, well, I'm not, no, I'm uh, not on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter here. Ones. But if I, yeah. if I may, in the meantime, yeah. though, I, I think, uh, I think again, one of, one of the things that we can draw on as a news organization, and maybe everyone else here too can, can as well, is that we have experience. We have editors, we have publishers, we have you know, we have people that have been in the city for decades upon decades. We have people who have been in the business for 20, 30 years that, that our reporters are accountable to. The editors, they're accountable to. The publisher, they're accountable to. So, I mean, you know, if, if we, there's a, there's, a, there's a pressure on them to make sure everything is accurate as, you know, 100% accurate as possible. And so that, that level of accountability and professionalism is, is built in. And it's something that, that's been there for decades and that'll continue to be there. And even that's not a guarantee. I mean, no, no, like no. what, 10, sure. 12 years ago, the Lethbridge Herald was taken to court for a specific story. And don't need to go into details of it. But I mean, and luckily they were able, they were found um, not, or not guilty for it, right? They didn't, they weren't convicted of anything. But it, I mean, the Lethbridge Herald had been around for almost 100 years by that point, And they had all this experience. And so even that's not a guarantee that sometimes, you know, just you present things just the wrong way and and come back to bite you. So you, yeah, you have to be careful. And and like um, like Garrett said, that only comes with experience. And, and like like I said, I mean, I we only have three years of experience as an organization. We don't have a hundred years of experience like the or over hundred years of experience like the lot of Gerald does. Um, but um, there's there are things that we've learned over the last um, three years. And and 
I think that's the only way that it can really, I think that's really the only way that you can determine uh, what can be published and what can't be. I, even when you compare um, someone with 30 years editorial experience for a news organization and someone straight out of the journalism school, I think the, the, the judgment's going to be different between those two people as well. And the person who comes out of journalism school after they've been in the, in the, in the industry for 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be, then you know, they, they change the way they do things. And sure, they take journalism ethics courses and that sort of thing, but when it comes down to it, it's experience that really makes the difference and helps you determine what you should and shouldn't report on. When Garrett touched on accountability, um, as a professional organization, we're obviously very accountable for a number of different levels. I guess that's the concern too with citizen journalism is, is there that level, multi-level of accountability and are they held accountable? Are people just reporting and if they get it wrong? Oh yeah, we're definitely held accountable. Mm -hmm. but, but our accountability doesn't come from our higher ups. Our accountability comes from the general public. But so does ours. So does ours. Yeah, and, and you're never you're sure with a citizen journalist too what kind of bias they might have. What kind of I mean, they could have have a certain slander in a story that that you really maybe can't trust as well as a traditional news source. But but again, like like I said, that that does come with time. And like I said, I, I still think getting back to the core of it that it, as many voices as you can, you can have out there and as many people that you can have disseminate information is mm -hmm. it's only going to help it's only going to make make things a little uh, easier for everybody because when it comes down to it that's the most important thing is getting information to the public I, I want to answer a question somebody asked why is Dory ask, uh, asking questions off of Twitter well tonight we were only allowed one media person per outlet and of course we have a lot of co-workers who want who want to be here as well asking questions and unfortunately they can't be here so we're being fed questions from other media people, um, even from outside of Lethbridge. I'm getting twi tweets from uh, Calgary and Edmonton. I have one from a reporter for, from the CBC in Edmonton. Um, citizen journalism, if that means folks sharing their thoughts and experiences, then that is all journalism. Pardon me, I'm getting the second part here. Uh, journalists then sift through those comments and experiences to find the facts using our training. Output is regulated. Anybody want to respond? Yeah, I, I agree with that. that. sums it up, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so how do you, uh, for Kim, what about accountability? How does Kim feel citizen journalists are held to a higher, not accountable, to a higher standard than traditional media? Um, well, I don't think that they're held to a higher um, level of accountability uh, because I think it's the same standard for everybody, I think. But is it? Yeah, I think that I think the general public has a expectation that a citizen journalists will provide the same level of professional information to uh, to the public. Okay, but expectation is different than accountability. The the expectation is there, but how are they accountable? Okay, well, like I the, the first time you asked that, asked me that question, like I said, we're held accountable to the general public, and I mean we're how. The, the, the question is how? Through the feedback we receive. When, when people take us over the coals and because we spelled something wrong or, and I mean, I, I've, I've had people approach lawyers about taking me to court because of something that appeared on Left Bridge News. And I mean, it's been a couple of years since that happened, but those sorts of things. So yeah, we definitely are held accountable for the things that we post. What degree of consequences is there for people who aren't towing the line? Well, they'll have, they won't be able to participate in Lethbridge News anymore. Have you ever had to do that? No. Would you ever do that? Yes. We haven't had to do it because everything gets um, uh, viewed, be everything goes into a queue and an editor review reviews it before it gets posted. People, the, we have a team of about 12 volunteers and people can't just post willy-nilly onto our website. It has to be, it goes through an editorial process before it gets published. Okay, let's address the issue about, um, at SACPAL you made the comment about journalism being nothing more than gossip. Well, that's not what I said. The uh, question actually, I listened back and you did. No, nope, that's <laughs> not what I said. So the question was, what is the difference between journalism and gossip? And I said, fundamentally, they're the same thing because they both talk about people or places or events. And then I elaborated on that by saying, people probably view gossip as something that's very negative and opinion-based and journalism
to be fact-based. They have an expectation that journalism is going to be fact-based and it's going to be objective and it's not going to be skewed by somebody's opinion. So that was my response. Okay. Kim isn't the only citizen journalist in the world, so we can't, <laughs> we can't <laughs> speak for everyone. Um, where's the future of journalism going, guys? Uh, obviously, even in the last 10 years, I don't think we've seen this much change in how we disseminate news, how we consume it. Where are we, where are we going? Is it just going to keep going a million miles a minute and this will be obsolete in 10 years? We won't be doing webcasts anymore? I hope not. But anyways, where, where do you think we're going with journalism? using citizen journalism as a tool along with it? I don't know, but I think somebody's going to figure out a way to make money off it. <laughs> <laughs> and when they do, then I think the landscape is going to change. And I don't know how they're going to do that yet, but um, because they've already started mm -hmm. adding, for instance, uh, the, the, major, the mainline news media has already started adding commercials to online content, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so uh, I think that that'll change the landscape when somebody figures out how you can make money off, off this. Right now, I think it's growing because you don't have those, you don't, you don't have those kind of impediments to getting the news and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure where it's going, but I, I know it is growing. It's um, more and more people are turning to that. And, um, Main Street, Main line journalism is having a harder time competing I think in terms of like you said over the years uh, um, you know spending has become an issue um, manpower has become an issue so I think they're looking at ways to deal with that but I'm not sure how they're going to yet so yeah and you're right a lot of companies a lot of newspapers a lot of radio stations and TV stations have really incorporated citizen journalism and made that a part of their of their coverage and that's I think that's that you're right that's only going to grow and uh, we just have to find a, figure out a way to to make sure it all meshes with our with our goals and objectives as a news organization, and make sure it's all done in as high, as high quality format as it can be. I guess it is, is how it boils down. And the gathering and dissemination of <coughs> news and information is going to continually evolve. I mean, Terry and I have seen it over how many decades. The the changes have been phenomenal. Um, sometimes it goes very very quickly. Um, comment again from a CBC reporter. If press releases become the only reason to look into a story, our democracy is in jeopardy. And that's very true. It is very mm -hmm. true. As journalists, we better be finding more than just press releases, and, and I think we do, uh, to, to stimulate um, our, our journalistic integrity and, and what we're looking for. There, there's got to be more than just the press release. And, and as I said when we began, uh, the press release is just the beginning of the story. It's just the beginning. At the end of the day, people are still, I believe, going to want an in-depth, professional right. story with different avenues and different sources that the average citizen just couldn't get. Mm -hmm. um, citizen journalism is awesome because everyone has a cell phone with a video camera on it that, you know, they just happen to be somewhere, something happens and they can capture it and get that breaking news that way. But as far as, you know, digging into stories that the average person doesn't think about in a normal day that maybe impacts them, that we sit there and are paid to think about and, mm -hmm. and make calls and, and write the stories, I think people are still going to need that avenue of news that doesn't just happen every day on the street. And, and from my perspective, I, I hope our society doesn't evolve away from <laughs> having such a short attention span that we can't sit down and read something for 10, 20 minutes and actually <laughs> keep our reading skills sharp and actually go through a newspaper or go through, uh, you know, go something, you know, I hope professors are still making kids write term papers and we don't lose uh, our ability to, to comprehend the English language in an in a, in a intelligible format. I mean, I hope people still will have that, that thirst and that hunger to actually sit down and read something and actually understand something. So again, that's, as a newspaper guy, that's, that's our hope. Whether the print product survives forever or not, I mean, it's, it's probably not going to survive past another, you know, who knows, you want to ask about the future. I, I think it's always, it's always going to be knows? changing and evolving, and we're just yeah. going to have to learn how to deliver the information in the different formats that the readers want. Magazines have been seeing this for years now. I mean, we've got magazines going out with augmented reality. Mm -hmm. You take your phone, you scan it over, you get a video, you get a podcast, you get other pictures. I mean, students are coming out of journalism school now with, with both video, audio, um, written skills. 
you know, they're right. becoming multifaceted. And it's great that we can take all of those things and incorporate them into whatever media group we're working for. And we need to be able to use that. And incorporating citizen journalism is just going to be a natural reality. And, and it's all going to segment towards everybody putting in their input into a story so that you don't you can get the short blurb you can get it as a video you can get it as a longer story that you can read you know it's it's bringing that information to the reader in whatever form they want to however they're going to access it and that's our jobs somebody's still annoyed that i'm looking at my phone but the, the whole <laughs> idea of this is we're supposed to be interactive get over it <laughs> trained media are the watchdogs who have flipped the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Part of the public's checks balances is um, trained journalism, and that's very true. That's but what we're supposed to be doing. I just uh, just going back to your question, and a couple of people have talked about it um, as far as uh, you know, where's journalism headed in the future? And it just reminded me of you know, it wasn't that long ago, five, six, seven years ago, that people were saying newspapers are on the way out, that they were gonna, they were a, a, a dying tool, and people are going to use them there. But you know, they're still around. I mean, maybe there are a few that have died out, but I think for the most part they've they've been around. And I think the reason why is because they're adapting. You know, they're adapting and trying to find different ways of being able to um, to receive the information and to be able to present that information in a way that people want. And and like TV news broadcasts are, have, are still around, and radio news broadcasts are still around. All these things have been around for a lot longer than citizen journalism. Well, I guess citizen journalism in in its simplest form has been around for a very long time, but regardless, in an organized fashion, I suppose. Um, I just don't see any of those going away. I think news is still going to be consumed in a variety of formats, and uh, there's going to be some people who like one format, and some people who like other format, and some people who want lots of formats so they can get a bigger picture. And, it, and I mean, I think journalists um, feel that they have a responsibility to provide as much detail as, as they can and provide a, as big a picture as they can. But sometimes it just doesn't always happen. Whenever I come across, even a New York Times article, and I'll read a, an article on something that's happened, and then I'll read about the same article in the Global Mail, both of them will be talking about uh, a few points that the others didn't. I mean, there will be lots of overlap um, between the, the points of the article, but there will be some points in each one. And so, it's, so I think there will be a lot of people who will look at a variety of new sources to try and get an accurate picture of, of what's happening. And I think... And, and I think that's been happening since the World Trade Center attacks. I really do. I think um, when people realized that they couldn't go to the New York Times or Los Angeles Times because their websites were completely gone uh, because of overload and they started going to the BBC and I think from there it just started growing where people started to consume information from a variety of news sources rather than one news source that they'd always depended on. And I think one positive thing about uh, citizen journalism or about competition is that for even mainline uh, broadcasters, if they see that the public wants more detail, more in-depth coverage, then they'll move that direction. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're there to, um, you know, make money and to to do a good job. And I think what they'll do is they'll follow whatever is happening with the public. So if, uh, if people want to see more detail and in-depth coverage, then I, was, I think we'll get to see more resources put into that sort of stuff. But are you concerned that when resources or money comes into the picture, all of a sudden journalistic integ integrity goes out the window? Mm -hmm. Well, I think over the years that's happened anyway. I think uh, most people, if they've been involved with any kind of business, uh, you can look at anything in the corporate world and it's kind of gone that way. Whereas resources aren't put into things the way they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah, I guess, are you talking, but are you, maybe we're talking about two different things um, in terms of maybe companies aren't putting as much money into newsrooms, mm -hmm. and we know that. Right. And was, but I mean, does the economy and does business determine what we cover and try to prevent us from covering certain items that need to be covered? Or do you feel the pressure? I don't feel the pressure, okay. and I, no. I never have. In fact, uh, it, it would sort of get my back up and okay. just make mm -hmm. me push back harder. Yeah. I, think. <laughs> yeah. I, I think most people would be the same way. But I, but I know everybody's feeling the pressure of uh, cutbacks in the economy and that sort of thing. Well, I think uh, no matter what happens with media, the lines are getting blurred. 
mm. no matter uh, we're all media here and I think at some point there won't be newspapers or radios or TVs at all just kind of be one happy family <laughs> under the kind of same umbrella we'll all be journalists whether we're citizen journalists or mainstream journalists so I'd like to thank the the panel for coming out tonight it's been a, a very interesting discussion and if this is the first real talk that we've done here on southernalberta.com I'm looking forward to many many more in the future so all uh, good luck to everyone here at the table in the future and everyone who tuned in I'm sure there will be a rebroadcast on southernalberta.com that you can tune into the entire thing if you missed uh, any portion of tonight's discussion so thanks again everyone we'll talk to you again soon <laughs>